Um, so I'm about to begin, so please take your seats. The strategy of this session is on reading, spelling, and writing difficulties, as well as learning strategies. I hope you are as ready as I am to learn more from the live speakers in this session today uh, on how we can better enable learners with dyslexia. We will be covering a variety of learning strategies to help learners with dyslexia cope better with their difficulties. Like before, if you have questions for the speakers, uh, please write them down on your uh, note paper or your post-it uh, and pass it to me at the end of the session or you can drop it at the question box at the registration booth outside the exhibition hall. Uh, your questions may be addressed at the panel discussion at the end of the day. All right, so without further ado, we'd like to now invite Dr. Ong Kui Hun to present her research on the use of ubiquitous autocaps to enhance phonological processing among struggling and poor readers. Dr. Ong is the president of the Dyslexia Association of Sarawak, Malaysia, Together with a group of parents and other interested individuals, Dr. Ong set up the Dyslexia Association of Sarawak in 2005. And since then, Dr. Ong and her team have conducted many workshops on dyslexia for parents and teachers from different parts of the state. Let us now welcome Dr. Ong. Thank you, Lois. Good afternoon. Now, it is indeed a great pleasure to be able to share uh, not research but our practice uh, in intervention uh, with uh, uh, all of you. So, I'm really glad to be able to be here to represent my team uh, to share uh, this strategy that we, we have tried, experimented, and we are very excited that it works with our uh, group of children. Right, so as was mentioned, um, the Dyslexia Association of Sarawak was uh, set up as a pro tem in 2005 and uh, we took two years to garner our courage to have, it, to have it registered in 2007. So within that two years, uh, we did a neat analysis and see whether Sarawak uh, do need, you know, does need a Dyslexia Association and we found that indeed you know, there was this uh, gap uh, in services, um, specialized services provided uh, for children with this uh, learning difference. So as uh, many of the presenters here, many of you who are here interested in dyslexia, it's because maybe we have a sibling or we have a child or maybe we ourselves have dyslexia. So in my case, why 205? Because in 204, my daughter was diagnosed with dyslexia. Then she was already in primary four. One day she came back and cried and said, Mommy, I'm not going to school anymore. Then I said, why? I was like, no, school, school is a torture chamber. I'm not going back. And uh, my, my teachers, you know, has been saying that uh, I'm not so clever, uh, has been punishing in, in Chinese school, in, in my place, you know, they, they whack, using a ruler to whack her palms and she was showing me her, her palms, you know, it's like got bruises because <laughs> she has been wet for a long time before. So I was so shocked and um, later went to school to talk to the teachers, her class teacher, and found that she was really not doing so well. That my, my husband and I, we were stupefied. We said, why? You know, such a clever girl. <laughs> she, in, in, in my family, my brothers and my sisters call her Loya Buro. So Loya Buro is like a if literal translation is uh, um, it is a, a lawyer, you know, who doesn't do well in the business but talk a lot, just talk, you know, empty air a lot. So she's like that. She talked so much, uh, but she couldn't really read well and spell. And when I opened up her exercise books, her BM, you know, English exercise books, oh, you know, the teachers read ink were more than her original pencil marks. So every line there were. There were mistakes, so we took two years to get her uh, to diagnose by the uh, British uh, Dyslexia Association, and I said, "Hey, girl, I was like that when I was in primary school." And but at that time, you know, my primary school we had dancing, we had art, we had singing, so it was not so difficult from primary one to primary four, and uh, primary three. But when it came to primary four, it was a real struggle for me. When my reading and spelling scenes were small, the teacher said, stand, stand up. Uh, so simple word you cannot spell. So I just stood up. 
when my sin was greater, you know, a uh, rather simple word was not able to be spelled correctly. They just said, stand on the table. So I had to stand on my desk. My, I was tall. My head was almost uh, up to the ceiling fan. And, and if the sea was even greater, my books were thrown out of the window, out the door, and I was made to stand outside the class. So, oh, then, you know, it began to trigger this, uh, this interest or maybe this desire to help my daughter and also help others who might be in the same predicament uh, that, uh, you know, a group of us just come together and say, why don't we do something? We advocate for our own children and for others. So that's where, you know, in, in 2005, the Dyslexia Association of Sarawak was born. So this will be briefly the structure talking about multi-sensory because bottle caps is more visual, is tactile, and a limited, little bit of kinesthetic, right? So my, why, why, you know, uh, we have been talking just now, we have been listening, you know, about multi-sensory uh, activities and phonological awareness and introducing this letter caps so you can see my ex university i just retired end of last year so i was with the university of malaysia sarawak so there's a small logo there because it's ip ip with the university and what are some of the activities that we can do with this letter caps and outcomes of a literacy camp that we use letter caps as a simple manipulative aid to enhance uh, phonological awareness. So multi-sensory activities, we know we learn through these five senses, but you know, generally schools in Malaysia, I do not know about Singapore, it, you know, teachers tend to use a chalk and talk method. Uh, so maybe visual and auditory, children see and see, you know, that the teacher will say, okay, C-A-T, cat. Everybody say cat, and there will be a picture of a cat. So they have to word, yeah, the word picture association or picture word association or the whole word language and they will learn other words that way. So it's more visual, you know, more auditory. Children really uh, do not see how the CAT can become cat. So here, learning to read is actually a multisensorial uh, activity. We have to see the word. We have to hear, we have to say it, say the word out so that we can hear it. Then we have to see how these words come together right, to form the word that we in intended. So it, it, this tennis where resonates very well with the, the look at it, look at the word, say it. So while you say, you hear it. Then you cover it, you write it, write out the word. Then you uncover the word and you check whether you got the word correct. So they see, they hear, and there's some tactile there, some kind of static activity there when they write it, and they see whether the word exists, whether whether it is correct, it matches, it matches correctly. So I was saying when I was in primary four, you know, uh, reading and writing was a bit difficult, was a struggle. So at the end, I was in a good class. So in, at the end of primary four, we have a summative exam. So it's the end of the year exam. I was second last in the class. And behind me, the last one, was an Indian girl who lived near my house. So needless to say, both of us got demoted down to a 5C class. Then at five, you know, when I was in primary five, I became the laughing stock of the class. And the teacher called me Miss Malapro. And I did, I did not understand what, is, what was the meaning then until when I was Form 3. I could use a dictionary when I was in Form 3. Oh, then I understood what is the meaning of Miss Malapro. When I wanted to say I sliced the mango, I would say I chopped the mango. And the whole class will rock into laughter. When I would say, hey, there's a tear in my skirt, I would say there's a skirt in my hair. And I, I did not realize that I was saying anything wrong until people were laughing and said, why did you not say again? What did you say again? And uh, going to the toilet and coming back to the class, I can get lost in my school. And so they were, the, teachers, the teacher was saying, why do you say things, you know, the opposite, opposite direction? 
So, but then I found a strategy when I was in primary five. I wrote and wrote and wrote. At that time, in the 60s, you know, this rough paper, recycled paper was not so easy to come by. So any small piece of clean paper, I would use a pencil to write down the word. So for example, I got, I got incredible difficulty with the word little, L-I-T-T-L-E, -T -T -L -E, because all the letters are standing straight and tall. I cannot see the T, I cannot see the I, and I will just say simply some other thing, some word. And another word that gives me difficulty until today is house, H-O-U-S-E. I have to look at the word, I have to cross my eye to see whether it's correct. Sometimes I have to write five alternatives of house to see, hey, which one looks correct to me. So I discovered this method of writing. I will write first with a pencil, H-O-U-S-E. I will fill up whatever small, small piece of paper with a pencil. Then I will use a blue ink. I will use a red ink. And I will just use a black ink overlapping on that small piece of paper. Now, you, by the time the second color ink, you really can't, I really can't see what word I'm writing, but it doesn't matter. I did not know about multi-sensory activity then. I did not know what was muscle memory, but that technique works. Any word that I want to remember, I just write, rewrite, and rewrite on the same piece of paper. And if, I have, if there is a picture that I wanted to remember, for example, I wanted to remember, you know, the, the structure of the ear when I was in, uh, um, you know, from four science class. I will draw it 10, 20 times and until today I will never forget the cross-section of the ear, the eye, whatever. Because it is in, probably, you know, in the muscle memory. And so, this tactile sensation uh, was important to me. And, and I think, yeah. It must be important to others who are struggling readers. So learning to read yeah, involves these uh, different, uh, different sensations. So here, different researchers and even, you know, we heard uh, presentations, they advocate that if we are teaching especially poor or struggling readers, even early readers, you know, beginning to read, then these multi-sensory activities uh, are important to help for, for comprehension, for understanding, and also reinforcement. Now, we heard this morning uh, from Prof. Uh, Fawcett about the, the different theories, yeah, the different theories in dyslexia. So here, one of the theories is the phonological deficit. Now, I find this a lot in my children that I work with. So they, you can tell them, air, bear. The second instance, you know, next instance, they will not be able to, they cannot hear it, they will say per air, per air, okay, per air, can you blend it together, per air, per air, they will say per air, the blending, you hear the two sounds, they cannot blend it, bear, and you say, okay, care, what are the two letter sounds you can hear in care, huh, care, no, there are two letters, two letters, care, you drag it out slowly, care, Hey, what are the two letters? They cannot hear the two different letter sounds inside care. Uh, so here we can see that this, in this phonological deficit theory of dyslexia, that they struggle with phonological awareness and uh, processing. So can you act to be, be act? They got problem. Okay, you have B, X. Bees, they, they have a problem. Okay, bees. Now, I want you to change s to m. Mm. Change. Yeah, they, they have a, a manipulation. Phony manipulation is important. And it, it, it's difficult for them. And you can say that this is due to the different uh, anatomical structure and functions in, in the brain, as uh, we have seen this morning from uh, Prof. Fawcett's uh, presentation. So, in Phonological awareness for, yeah, we, we had presentations in comprehension, which is really down the journey in our reading process. So at the beginning, the decoding and coding stage, I guess the, the phonological awareness has to be grounded. 
uh, because you see research has shown that this various research has shown that children who are good readers, they are, they are good they are good readers, their phonological processing skills are intact. But children who are poor readers, uh, majority of them, a significant majority of them, are going to have poor phonological skills. And so here we really would like look you know, so in my association, my team and I, you know, we look for a simple method uh, to enhance this. So here, phonological awareness is really made up of these uh, six sub skills in um, in reading. Right. So we take a minute to watch.
just memorize as men. But you know, when we did this, oh right, you begin to understand. So so you do the CV, and then you do the VC syllable. So when you put the A in front, follow my finger. M, okay, M, and when the M moves nearer, left to right, M, M, M. You know he was like M. First he was like M, 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 like the M. But then suddenly it dawned on him, it's M. It's a word that he has used before, has heard before. M. He was like M again. Now the the M is like understanding. Oh, that that is the word I understood. I have used before. So. Here, using this physical manipulative aid, like you set the rules, you show them the rules, how this phonics work. And when it is CBC, so for example, mat, right? Then you have a, so you have a T here. So with this, mat. Now if the child has forgotten, I will take away, and pull out my A again. Okay, follow my finger, say the letter sound. Mm, man. Right? And he gets it, man. Repeat, man. So I will put them together. And uh, sometimes I will use this. It's just a cardboard that I cut it out. So it's man, it's a syllable, and I will encase it on. I will put it within the two, inside the two border caps. Say the sound of this syllable, man. Read this, read this, man. Okay, man. Then I will introduce my consonant. Okay, what does this syllable say? Man. Okay, follow my finger. Mat. Mat. Then you can move the man nearer when it is in contact. Met. So, met, 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 met. And sometimes the word suddenly dawn on him. That, hey, it's a word I know, met. Then you show a picture. Okay, this is a mat. Okay, do, does your house, how many mats uh, do you have in your house? Oh, mm, I have one at the front door. Oh, yeah, is it round or is it a uh, square or rectangle? Well, any word written on it. So, that's why you try to engage some um, conversation, you know, some comprehension in this word, met. So, like I say, here in, in this thing, we have, it is like the uh, uh, letter Tal and June just now was saying that Dyslexia Association of Singapore use it as the finger fast uh, tool, you know, in, in finger spelling, uh, where they use the letter Tal. So, similarly, so we try to use letter Tal. Okay, all right. Uh, so, however, uh, we say this water caps is free and it's three dimensional, you know, it's easy to manipulate. Now, these are some of the examples of activities that you can use. You can matching letters. So, for our early re beginning readers, we have A, B, C, Z, and then we have the water cap, and they match A, B, C, D in order. And then they can arrange the letters into the alphabet series, auditory processing, okay, cat, change to cut change to mat, change to man. So that's auditory, then blending and segmenting using the bottle caps. So we had a one week literacy camp. These children are struggling readers. They are in remedial education in their primary school. We took them out one week, only six days actually. It's one week, but registration, end of camp, we have a talent night, it's only six days. And we do the pre-test, progressive, the third day, post-test, and we have post-test too, which is two months after the end of the camp. It means they've gone back to school, we have no contact with them. And we found out that, you know, their ability to read the number of CVs, uh, number of CVC words read correctly in one minute, maintain even, you know, at the end of two months. So, uh, we, we think that, you know, they, they really have the mastery of the decoding uh, process in, in their brain already. Uh, we did a significant testing and we found out that the pre and the post test too were significantly different. So we did this camp all over Sarawak with the uh, children in remedial education. They failed the literacy test and we found similar positive results. So these are some photos shared with you with children using our water caps. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Um, it's, it's very clear that you're so passionate and have such rich information. Thank you for sharing. I think, uh, I don't know about you, but I'll look at Bottle Cats in a totally different light. <laughs> okay, um, so um, I'd like to invite now um, Ms. Kwek uh, Giksa, Director of Human Resources and Corporate Services in the Dyslexia Association of Singapore to present um, Dr. Ong a token of appreciation. Thank you.